Hebrews chapter 13, we're going to look at verse 17. And I've titled this, you know, called to be submissive, prayerful, and blessed. As we come to the end of this book of Hebrews, my prayer for you is that you would have learned a lot about your faith in Christ through the teaching of his word. And I also pray that this word that we have walked through will have taken root in your hearts so that it's already begun to grow and possibly borne some fruit in your life as we've walked through this letter. And the importance of this letter, was, which was written to Jewish Christians who were being pressed by their family and their friends to go back to their old ways of Judaism. Uh, the importance of it is, is that Jesus has fulfilled the law of Moses and the prophets. Jesus is greater than uh, you know, being the sacrificial lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, he, he's greater than everything else. He's greater than religion. He's greater than the law of Moses. He's greater than the prophets. We need nothing else. We need not go back to or turn away to something else. And the writer of this book of Hebrews shows that being justified by faith in Christ is all a believer ever needs that Jesus mediates a better covenant and he offers a better sacrifice so now by our faith in Christ God requires all he requires of us uh, is to simply keep our faith and trust in Jesus Christ and if we have that kind of faith then we've entered into the promises of God which are the fullness of life now and eternal life to come. No matter what I'm facing now, whether it be pain wretched in my body or some circumstance in front of me that's greater than me that's trying to devour me, then my faith in Christ is greater than any of that. And it will see me through because I'm looking to him and I'm trusting in him. That's what we've been seeing in this whole book. And when the writer comes to a close here in this chapter, um, he's given us in chapter 13 alone nine exhortations or you could say nine proofs or commands that, that are given to us as we're born again. They, I should be able to read Hebrews 13 and say, okay, this, this is in my life. It, and somehow this is here teaching me that I've been given a brand new life in Christ. That I'm, I don't go back to the old one to try to make something happen. I walk forward in him. In, in these nine exhortations, we've looked at the call to be loving, the call to be pure, the call to be content, the call to be a follower, the call to be stable. Last week, we looked at the call to be thankful, and the last three of these, they, they, I'm going to do the three because they flow together. There's an order here, a very important one. And that's called to be submissive, called to be prayerful, and called to be blessed. You know, God wants to bless you, but he doesn't want to bless you the way the God on TV wants to bless you. He wants to bless you with faith in his son. So that as you face the trials of your life, you have the assurance that he's going to see you through them for your good and for his glory. And you don't have to make something happen. God does not want to give you a Cadillac. Get, get that clear. He doesn't want to put money in your pocket. That's not the blessing he wants to bless you with. He wants to bless you with faith to trust in his son. The only thing that's going to see you through the trials that you're facing uh, will be that. So let's look at that, verse 17. 
I'll walk through that first. He says, obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. So we're called. It's a call to be submissive to your leaders. Now, the word submissive, very important word. It means to exercise gentleness, to be submissive. It, it speaks of to be depressed and speak humbly without browbeating. God put leaders in the church. There's a reason for that. And he put them there specifically for each fellowship of believers. And the submissive part would be to exercise gentleness in, in word and in action and in deed to your leaders. Because they're given to you. When I was in the Marines, you learn a chain of command. And I had a sergeant that was over me who would go to battle and he's telling me what to do and telling me where to go. Why? So I don't step on a landmine. So I don't walk into an ambush. He's given me clear direction from the authority over him to see me through alive while fighting the enemy. And so very important in, in, the, in the church that God puts leaders. Why do you think there's so many false teachers out there? Because they want some authority in the church. And they know people will, will submit to that, or some will in that way. But we're called to submit. And it says, obey your leaders and submit to them. Literally, it means have confidence of their authority. What? That it's from the leading of the Holy Spirit. You should have a complete confidence that the leadership that's over you is being led by the Holy Spirit. You know, it's not me and Pete sitting in a room somewhere. What do you think someone would think if I said that? What do you think someone would think if they said that? What do you think we should go with this? No, no, no. being led by the Holy Spirit in that. So in they, to do that as they teach you, you know, um, remember that your leaders are under shepherds, under the great shepherd who's directing them to speak into your life through his word. You get that? You come, you have issues, because we're the church. You have complaints. You have circumstances that are beyond your control. You have health issues and different things that press against you. And God has an answer for you, for them. And he put leaders in the church that they would teach you his word under the direction of the Holy Spirit and give you what you need to hear from him for direction in that. To many, they reject that. Why do you think people church hop? As soon as they're, they're poked, as soon as God speaks to a heart, they go, I'm out of here, man. No one's going to tell me what to do. No one's going to give me direction in that. And people just bounce around from church to church to church until they get what they want to hear. Well, God knows what you need to hear. I don't. And the leaders shouldn't. But they listen to the Lord and they teach you his word. He says here, for they keep watch over your souls. It means their labor is to watch over your souls. He says, as those who will give an account, God will judge them on how well they did this. How well they watched over your souls. And he says, let them do this with joy and not with grief. It means literally give them a reason to report to him about you joyfully. I report to God about many in our fellowship joyfully. Some, I, I do it with sorrow. Some, I do it in grief. It's hard. I come before you again with a broken heart for this one, Lord. They just don't hear. They won't hear you. They pack up, they move on, they go somewhere else to, to hear what they want, to get what they want. They're not listening to you. And, and he says, literally, um, for this would be unprofitable for you. It means you will suffer for it also. Why? Because you're on the wrong road, probably. You get the clear direction from the Lord, do this. And you, you go, I don't want to hear that. I'm moving on somewhere else. And then you face it again, and you face it again, and you face it again, and you face it again until finally there's breakthrough, and God breaks through and says, all I'm trying to do is build up your faith in my son. Would you do what I say? Would you listen? 
So, so this call here to be submissive, uh, again, obey your leaders and submit to them for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief for this would be unprofitable for you. You know what that tells me? Number one, that God mediates his rule in the church through spirit-led men. That's what he does. God chooses men to lead his bride, to direct them to their groom, to oversee them so they make it on that wedding day. God raises men, spirit-led men, to do this. So uh, men who are willing to come under his authority to oversee his people. That's the call of God in someone's life when they're called into the ministry uh, in, as, the, as, a, as an overseer in the church. Spirit-led men who he speaks through as they teach his word. And it also shows me that the responsibility of the leaders sh must be acknowledged. There's an acknowledgement that that person is an overseer of, of the bride of Christ here in that. So, so it mean, literally, listen to them as they teach you his word. Why? Because they're seeking his will for your life and they're giving you what he desires them to for you. Get it? It's not, let's put together a three-point sermon and say what I want. It's go before God, and this is the chapter that we're in. Lord, what do you have to say here to your people? They have come in. This one's facing this. This one's wrestling with that. This one's got weight that's pressed upon them, and it's beating them down. This one doesn't even know where they're going right here. And God's saying, I've got the answer. Teach my word. Follow the leading of my spirit in the teaching of my word. And what happens? God then mediates his rule in the church through spirit-led men. So their responsibility must be acknowledged in that. Uh, you know, they're doing what they've been called to do by God. So let them do it. And it says they watch over your souls. That's unbelievable. How do the overseers, the leaders of a church, watch over your souls? First of all, by making authoritative decisions. Someone, someone always has to make a decision. And I'll tell you what, my personal nature is not an authority decision-making nature. I hate making them. I tell you that right now. I don't want to be in charge of nothing. I've, I've faced that enough in my life. But I have to make decisions of great authority. Because I'm not here to oversee where I'm going. I'm here to oversee where you're going, where he's leading you. So as I face a decision, I have to make it no matter what. I have no choice. Lord, here I go. I make this decision. Yes, you go. Run with that. Yes, you go do this. No, we're not going to go there. Yep, we're going to go here and do that. And then I let that decision fall in the hands of the Lord. And when you make a decision like that as a leader in the church, you stand upon it. You can't waver in it. It's not about friendships. It's about overseeing God's people. In the end, you don't give an account of overseeing this fellowship. In the end, there's a few of us that will. And we'll give an account to him of, of not about um, whether we should be in a building or not and not about whether we should paint a building or not. We give an account of what we've given you from his word. The clear direction handed out. And the writer of the book of Hebrews has spent 13 chapters giving the Jewish believers the answer to all their problems. And now at the end, he's driving that home in that, in, in a very powerful way. Um, you know, the implication here is that the leaders should not be so quick in making decisions of great importance. But when that decision's made, they need to stand upon it without wavering. How else do leaders in the church watch over your souls? Well, most importantly, by feeding you the word of God. When you come into this fellowship, you're gonna have a, you'll come into a fellowship of believers. But whether I like it or not, whether you like it or not, you're going to get the word of God. 
And because I don't come up here and paint a pretty picture every time I teach you the word of God, it ruffles many feathers. Because God is in, this, in the, the story of ruffling feathers. He's trying to get you to change. He's trying to show you to drop down your pride. And we go, ah, I'm not proud in that area, Lord. Well, then why are your feathers being ruffled there? Well, it's Ron. He just doesn't like me. And Pete, he doesn't like me. No, that's not the case. We love you very much. And the leaders here over this church in, in, in Israel, Jerusalem, the, over the Hebrews, loves them enough to tell them the truth. And a very important one at that. In Titus chapter 2, verse 15. Paul writes, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a particular people, zealous and full of good works. He says, these things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority and let no man despise you. That's what the leaders are called to do. That's how they watch over your souls. You know, every time we listen to the word of God, we listen to it read, we listen to it explained, we should be asking ourselves, how can we apply these truths to our lives? You know, you, here today, you're going to hear the word of God, right? You should be saying, Lord, how can this word change my life? That's why you're here. You don't maybe not think so. But you're here, God has your answer in his word. And when it goes forth, if you come away from a teaching of God's word without being challenged to become more like Christ, you may have not been listening with a desire to grow in Christ likeness. Things you learn should come to mind again and again as you seek to apply them daily in your walk with him. You know, Ron taught that yesterday. Pete taught that last Wednesday. And here I am facing that situation in my life. God, before this ever happened in my life, you gave me the answer last week. There it is. I know exactly what to do. I'm facing temptation. It's right in front of me. And yet last week, I remember exactly what you showed me. Walk away. So I get up and I walk away and let the chips fall where they may, no matter what in that. You know, uh, to listen to the things that are taught uh, should help you become an active doer and not just a passive listener. If the teaching has a title, write it down or write down the topic as you understand it because it may click something in your mind during the week that you remember, oh, you know what? Ron talked about submissiveness. He talked about prayerfulness. He talked about being thankful. He talked about loving in, in all those things. Uh, record each scripture reference given so you can read them later on. As out, well, people, oh, I can't take notes. I can't listen to you and take notes at the same time. You certainly can. You drive a car and eat a sandwich at the same time. The scripture goes out, Titus 2, 15. You're going to write that down. Or look it up tomorrow or tonight. And read again. I remember what was taught from God's word. It's given that way. You know, make notes on the meanings of the passages and what, what the teaching is about. Identify any truths that you think God may be revealing to you. Lord, how do I handle this situation? I've dealt with this my whole life and there's been no change. God's saying, then why would you continue to handle it the same way you're handling it? Listen to my word. Lord, you showed me something. I'm going to write that down. I'm going to do what you say in this because you're going to change direction here. You know, I always say, learn to listen, but listen to learn. Listen to the word of God to learn what God's saying to you. He's given you an active answer. I should be, this is listening to learn. Number one, how should these truths change my belief? It forces me. Is what I believe even biblical? How should this truth that you've given me, you've just taught, 
change my beliefs? Number two, how should these truths change my behavior? I'm walking out of the church building. I'm thinking, do my actions please you, Jesus? Do they really bring joy to you? Or is it a whole different ballgame? You know, number three, how should these truths change my motivations? Do my desires reflect a submissive heart? Am I really willing to make changes? Number four, how should these truths change my worldview? Do I really desire to grow into the image of Christ? Do I really have a desire to encourage others in Christ and seek to save the lost, no matter what they shout and throw back at me? So, so areas, you know, uh, identify areas of truth where you need to grow in as the words taught. God is faithful to show you through his word every single time. You know, are there commands from scripture that I'm not obeying? Are there examples that describe how I should or should not live? What's my first step that I need to take to change something that you've shown me, Lord, is hampering my growth in you? What should I do? Where should I put up a safeguard that I even think about one before until you reveal to me something in my life? You know, so very important. And what are the consequences of ignoring the truth of your word? We got done the book of Jeremiah. You know what I remember, and I'll never forget, through that whole teaching, we spent a year in Jeremiah, almost an exact year, I think, right? I think Dan had the thing down. It was almost an exact year. You know, from that, I learned about the consequences of rejecting God's truth daily. I don't do it on Sunday. No, I'm teaching it. And then Monday hits, and I'm walking somewhere, and here God revealed his truth to me and showed me, no, you don't belong down that road. That road is far away from me, Ron. And I have to make this choice. You know what, Lord? I don't like the consequences of going down that road. I want the fruit of the Spirit in my life, bearing it in my life. I want you to be able to take from me all the patience that's born in me by facing what I face and trusting Christ. I want you to take from me all the loving kindness, all the gentleness, all that mercy, all the fruits of the Spirit that are for yours. And your desire should be the same for everybody else. Do you ever have, I don't have patience with that guy anymore. Oh, God wants, how much patience God wants you to have with that guy? Unconditional, unconditional. If you don't have patience anymore, then you're bearing your own fruit. Listen to the truth of God's word and bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit in that. So all in all, in verse 17, your leaders feed you the word of God, okay? Every service that they gather together. Why? Because your leaders know that God's word has all the answers you're looking for. Your leaders fully understand that through the teaching of God's word, the feeding of the flock, God will speak into your life and give you clear direction if you let it in, if you receive it into your heart. That's how your leaders watch over your souls. Um, they watch over your souls also by, by walking in love and humility. I am called of God. Your leaders are called of God to choose love and humility, to cast aside fear and anger and all the flesh that's there. And, and it's a daily walk to do that. To be reminded constantly, these are your people, Lord. I can't tell you how many people say to me, how about your church? And I'm like, it's not my church, man. These are God's people, washed by his blood, giving them what God wants them to have. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 4, Peter says, I exhort the elders who are among you, I being also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. He says, feed the flock of God among you, taking oversight, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for sordid gain, but readily, not as lording it over those allotted 
uh, to you by God, but becoming examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, you'll receive a never-ending, fading crown of glory. God raises up servant leaders, not dictators. I'm not, this is not a shepherding movement. I, I'm not going to tell you who to marry. I'm not going to tell you what job you need to have. That's not my call. My call is to feed you his word. And if you're willing to listen to that word and hear what he's saying, therein is the answer. The answer even may be just be still and know that I'm God. Or well, the answer may be change direction here. Whatever it is, God's going to show you that through his word. It's not dictatorship. It's servant leadership. Why? So the church can grow and mature. You know, I grew up um, in a household where spanking wasn't against the law. Remember those days? Everybody remember? Grew up that way? You spank your kid today, you go to jail. I was talking to somebody the other day. I'm like, the problem is you don't spank your children. And this lady said, well, we reason with them. You don't reason with a five-year-old. You spank them. Well, what if someone found out we spanked them? <laughs> spank them. I don't know. <laughs> don't be afraid because you, you're not dis God loves me enough to correct me. And that correction isn't fun. My dad loved me enough to correct me when I was a kid. <laughs> you know, the, the belt part. That was not fun. And now as a, as a dad and a grandfather, I understand it wasn't fun for him either. Probably want to come home and play ball. Come home and do something. I'm going to come home and spank my son. Oh, joy, joy, joy. No, not at all. But I, you learn from that. So, so in, very important, in, in Ephesians 4.11... It says, he truly gave some to be apostles and some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers. What? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edification of the body of Christ. So what verse 17 is saying here literally is, as the church leaders make authoritative decisions, as they feed you the word of God, as they walk in love and humility, that's what gives you the power of God to make the choice to mature in Christ. And, and the writer of Hebrews is stressing that point. It's that important. He wants these Jewish believers to grow and mature in Christ, not to go back to their old ways because that won't help them at all. <clears throat> Look at verse 18. Here's the call to be prayerful. It tags right along. Pray for us, for we are sure uh, that we have a good conscience, desiring to conduct ourselves honorably in all things. And I urge you all the more to do this, so that I may be restored to you sooner. This is a call to be prayerful. Now, prayerful or pray, praying, prayer, is a very strong word. It's actually a strong action word, and it implies asking earnestly in submission before God. I have had many people come to me and tell me all their problems. I've had many people come to me and tell me all my problems with them in, in great ways. But I tell you what, I, I am so blessed to find out that somebody was praying for me. You know how important it is to pray for your leaders? Do you know the weight they carry for your souls? If you've, unless you've ever overseen a church being called of God and the leading of his Holy Spirit, you have no idea what that weight is. But that weight will put you to tears. It breaks you down. You get home, and you're exhausted. You lay your head down. You have no more strength left. And somebody calls you and God fills you right back up and you do it all over again. And you do it with joy because you're serving your master. Remember in Scripture, I think it's in Matthew, where he says the servant goes out and works the field all day, comes back in, he's exhausted, he makes his master's meal, sits it down before he even makes his own. Why? Because he's doing what a servant does. Don't leave this place today and say, Ron was complaining about being a leader again. I'm telling you the truth. That's the call of what it means. Don't leave and say, Ron said, don't. Don't talk to me about your problems. That's not what I'm saying. And I hope you have ears to hear. Because I walk out my call 
And so does Pete. And we do it for the glory of God. We do it so you can hear him. He's got the answer for you. And we give you his word every single time. So the call to be prayful. Pray for your church leaders. Why? They've been given by God the labor of overseeing you. If you've got something about me, take it to him. It's really hard when people come to me and have all these complaints about other people. Go to God. He's the one that can handle it. He'll, he'll show you really clear. You know, the issue with all these complaints is your heart. You're not trusting my son in this area of your life. And that's why this griping and moaning and complaining, it's all there. God makes it very, very clear. Because the church leaders need your prayers, not only as men, but as ministers of God, as stewards of, of the bride of Christ, faithfully dispensing the word of God without any regard to favor or the frowns of men as good stewards of the mysteries of God. Your leaders need your prayers, very much so. So please pray for them, because it's that important, very much. In 2 Thessalonians 3, chapter 1, Paul says, Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of God may have free course and be glorified, even as it is with you, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for all men have not faith. You know, when you're a pastor, you wouldn't believe how many people want to talk to you about, about their version of who God is. And they, and they waste so much of your precious time. It's amazing to me. And putting together the word to, to go forth and, and, and show forth in that way. Um, in verse 19, he says, And I urge you all the more to do this, so I, I may be restored to you sooner. What he's, he's calling them to strive together in their prayers because he knows that God answers prayer. The writer of Hebrews wants to go see these Jewish believers. But he's being hindered for some reason. Whether it's Satan, whether it's some issue, whether it's false teachers, whatever the case is, he's being hindered. And he's saying, pray for me also. I'm, I want to come see you. And I understand that if you pray for an open door, God is going to open the door. The one thing your leaders believe in is prayer. And they know the prayers of the saints work. You know what? Um, God doesn't answer gripes or groaning or grumbling or arrogant attitudes through misguided or misdirected people. God answers the prayers of his saints. And the believers are being called to pray for their leaders in the same way as their leaders are praying for them. He's saying, strive together before God and earnestly in submission go before him. For us, it's that important, you know, to, to pray in that way. So as believers, we're called to be submissive to our leaders. We're called to be prayerful towards them. And then lastly, we're called to be blessed. Again, God wants to bless you but not with material things. And if he does bless you with material things, praise God. Tell you know, God blesses people with finances and we're going to be building his church and get a lift together and, and got the paint supplies and all that. Praise God for that. But that's not the blessing he's talking about here. Look at verse 20. Now the God of peace who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ to him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. That's the blessing God wants to bless you with, with enough faith to trust his son that you can face every day of your life for his glory. And to know that I'm accomplishing your will regardless of how my day turns out because it's you I'm trusting in and it's you I'm finding my rest in. The word blessed is a powerful word uh, in the Hebrew. It means to be straight. It means to be level. It means to be right. It means to be happy. It means to be well off. It means to be fortunate. And, and the only way a sinner can truly be blessed of God is through the blood of his son, our Lord Jesus Christ, because that is the only way to be forgiven of sin and made whole and righteous and justified before a holy God. That's the blessing. God doesn't want to bless you with a religious experience. 
He wants to bless you that you can stand and make a stand and by faith trust in Christ alone. Church didn't save me. Church didn't do that. Calvary Chapel didn't save me. Baptist Church didn't save me. Catholic Church didn't save me. I was unsavable. Everybody tried, but they couldn't do it. Until Christ showed me the sinner that I was and the need for a Savior. And when I trusted Him, I tossed everything else aside. Because when you trust Him, truly trust Him, what else do you need? But faith in Him. And faith in Him overcomes all things. So the writer is trying to drive that home. That's the blessing. You know, you may be blessed by God who's placed all things together, uh, who makes all things straight, who causes all things to be level, all things to be happy. But the blessing is this, a permanent mark through the sacrifice of Jesus who shed his blood and sealed an eternal covenant for you by rising from the dead. And be settled in that. I know that I know that I know you're my Lord. And I know that I know that I know I wholly trust you for my salvation. I don't need religion. I get in trouble a lot with that because people are very religious. People have religious books and they have religious things. And they go, oh, Ron hates religion. I, you know what? I do. But I love my relationship with Jesus Christ. You can keep your religion. When you have a relationship with him, what else comes close to that? Nothing. And the challenge, I guess, here is God is saying, would you finally let me in so we can develop a relationship? Would you finally just let me come in so that we can birth something alive here? Something substantial that you can build upon. Something that my Father can build upon in your heart. Something that will give you clear direction from me. Would you let my Spirit have His work in your heart? Would you let it happen? Really. Um, may God prove to all of us all we need is Him. Uh, he's the Messiah. This is what gives God great pleasure, that we trust his son in that light. So there's a call here, a call to be submissive to your leaders. Why? They're given by God to give you his word, which has every answer you need right there. And then to be prayerful, to pray for your leaders, because they need your prayers. As much as you need to pray for them, they need them. And then a call to be blessed. And the blessing is, is, is to have faith in Christ. Jesus is given all the glory of God. You understand that? All glory goes to him. And we glory in that. It's an important uh, picture that's there. By trusting him as our great shepherd, um, as, as the Messiah, uh, it, it it pleases him because the sacrifice that Jesus gave brings all the glory to God. And God turns it back and gives all the glory to his son. And so we honor him in that. He's given all the glory because he's both God and he's the mediator between man and God. And the glory of God is is both given to him as God, the glory of his deity, the glory as we worship him, uh, of his divine protections, and as a mediator, the glory of our salvation, the glory of our redemption is given to him because he alone obtained it for us. That's what he's writing here. Uh, that as we trust in him alone, by looking to him alone for our peace, for our pardon, for our justification, for, uh, you know, our salvation, our eternal life, as we look to him and trust in him, that's what pleases God. The church has turned it around. While me living a holy, pure life, that pleases God. Guess what God understands I can't do? Live a holy, pure life. Oh, I'll strive to for the rest of my life. But guess who's going to have a bad thought one day? Guess. Me. I know. I know. I'm your pastor. I had a bad thought. Holy, unholy. My holiness 
is Christ in me. My righteousness is Christ in me. And as I trust in him and face the trials of my life each and every day, it pleases God. That's more important to him than anything else, that my faith and trust is in his son. You'll never truly be blessed of God by being religious or by following some religious ordinance or by trying to keep the law. It's, it is and always will be from the blood of Jesus Christ alone. And, and, and the writer here in verse 22, But I urge you, brethren, bear with this word of exhortation, for I've written to you briefly. Yeah, briefly. No, uh, he's written an awful lot and given it to us. You know, um, take notice that our brother Timothy has been released with whom, if he comes soon, I will see you. Greet all of your leaders and all the saints. Those from Italy greet you and grace be with you. So he says, bear with this word of exhortation. Endure, put up with this teaching. Every time it's taught. Endure, put up with it. If you're getting poked, then understand it's the Lord that's poking you. If you're getting encouraged, it's God that's encouraging you. If you're receiving direction, it's God that's giving you direction. So he's saying put up with it because it'll bring comfort, strength, and cheer to the body of Christ. Do you know that when the word's taught and God gives you direction and you step in that direction, it may be the answer for the person next to you. You have no idea why God directs you down a road. It's certainly to strengthen your faith in him, but it's also to be a living testimony and a witness to those around you. That maybe no one else had the strength to make that stand. And you did. You made that stand. And you become this living testimony of one who trusts in the true and living God. And someone else gets encouraged by that and says, you know what? I, I, I can be that bull. I can step by faith in that area. That person did it. I can certainly do it in that. We're called to be submissive to our leaders because they seek God for our souls, teaching us his word, which is the answer you've been looking for. Uh, so receive the word that's taught and grow in your faith. And then pray for your leaders because they need your prayers, not your grumblings or your murmurings or complaints. They need your prayers so that they'll give you the word God has for you so that you might be blessed. That's what he's saying here. So be submissive to your leaders and be prayerful for your leaders. Why? So you'll be blessed. Imagine if all I ever hear is complaints, 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 and then nobody prays for me, and I come in here and I kneel down and I open up the word and say, Lord, what do you have for your people? And all I'm hearing in the back of my head is complaints. Oh, so-and-so's complaint. Oh, don't teach that. They're going to complain. Oh, don't say that. You're going to hurt someone. Oh, don't do that. They're going to get mad at you. And yet, no, if you're praying for me, a battle zone happens. Then the enemy that's coming in to take my mind and to get it off of the word of God is laid low. And there's a freedom. You know, over and over, if you read about the different patriarchs of the past, you find out that there's so much prayer that goes on in a church. I remember hearing the story one time about D.L. Moody. Uh, it was either D.L. Moody or Charles Spurgeon. I don't remember which one it was. But somebody came in and they heard about the heating system in the building that he had. It was before service. And he said, come on, I'll go and show it to you. And he had a pair of overalls on. And he brought them down there and he opened up a locked door. And he opened up, there's like 15 or 20 people laying on the floor, praying four hours before service. Praying for the Lord to move, for God to soften hearts, that they might hear his voice and receive Christ and walk in the freedom of being born again. And he showed them the heating system, and they were shocked at what they saw. He closed the door, went back up, and then that later that day, <coughs> excuse me, it, it was Charles Spurgeon. He changed clothes. Got up and preached. You want to know the fire behind my message? It's not me. It's the Holy Spirit who's been given the freedom through your prayers to speak to you that which you need to hear. Get it? It's that important. And it's that fundamentally important. Um, your leaders desire that you might truly experience the lordship of Jesus Christ in your life. 
I know the leaders in this church want you to trust Jesus Christ with every area of your life because he, he has, he is the answer. He says, um, our Savior here in heaven, you know, Jesus is in heaven, so he's got hands and feet on this earth. And he's got a voice. He's speaking right now through the teaching of his word. Why? To equip you for your life here on earth as an instrument of his. That's what he's doing. Tenderly, he desires to set the broken bones of your life so that you might walk blessed and run your life successfully, this life race that you're in. He wants to mend the net of your life so that you might catch men and win souls. He wants to equip you for battle and outfit you so that you're not battered by the storms of life. He wants to mature you so he can work in you and work through you that which pleases him and accomplishes his will. That's what he wants to do in that. And he does that, again, how? Through his taught word by your leaders, through the prayers of the fellowship to bless you in that. So as we come to the close of this book of Hebrews, the whole reason God taught this book every Sunday was to give you his word so you would have the power, the authority to make decisions based according to that which pleases him, to be drawn closer to Christ by faith, to walk with him, to love one another, to go out there and share the gospel with people, and just to face life as it comes each and every single day. So so if that has not happened, it's not God's fault, and it's not my fault. Whose fault is it? It's yours. Listen to learn, because God is giving you the answer you need to hear. And, And he's telling you, So give him the opportunity of being pleased with you by doing as he says. The answer to all your problems can be found only in your relationship with Jesus Christ. So take a moment right now. Do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Do you know him as Lord? I believe everybody in this building does. But do you know him as friend? Lord, that means he's on the throne over my life. That's the lordship of Jesus Christ. Amen to that. But as a friend, I understand he's with me every moment of the day. Directing me, leading me, comforting me, guiding me in decisions that I'm facing. I look around, I believe he's Lord to everybody in this room. But is he your friend? Do you let him lead you? Do you allow his word to penetrate your heart, to soften it, to strengthen your faith, and to trust in him in everyday decisions? God wants you to do that, and it's done by by submitting to the word that's taught, by now praying for your leaders so that God will bless you. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the grace you've given us to walk through this book of Hebrews. And thank you for today's word. And and whether it was understood or not, Lord, drive it home in every heart that it would accomplish exactly the exact purpose you set it out to accomplish. Let it reveal your son as Lord and let it reveal your son as friend, as guide, as director, as, as all the things that we need. Lord, help us, continue to lead us, and just oversee this fellowship. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.